Okay, thanks everybody. Welcome back. Uh, Jesse Lee is going to show us how to mine uh, relationships from animal movement data. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. thanks. So, yeah, I think before I talk about stuff, I think I better introduce myself. Actually, I'm not a biologist. I, my background is in computer science. And so I think it's worth to mention why I'm here. So, uh, actually, I'm an assistant professor in, in information science and technology at Penn State University. And so, as I said, my background is computer science and do data mining. So, I mostly mine spatial temporal data. So anything that related to space and, and temporal, I'm very interested in to mine. And so I have been collaborating with Ronant and Mac for, for quite a few years since I was a PhD student. Uh, so we have been working on several um, data mining methods to mine uh, the patterns in the animal movements. So that's why I got involved into this move bank thing. Uh, so we start well, in 2010, and we have designed like periodic pattern mining, uh, moving cluster mining, or follow leader uh, pattern mining, and also attraction avoidance mining. So I think today I'm going to mainly show the follow leader and also attraction avoidance patterns. Okay. So uh, why I call this move mine 2.0? Because we did have this 1.0 before. Then when I was a PhD student, I graduated from University of Illinois and also my former advisor is here. So uh, I implemented this 1.0, and this one was many, uh, let me see whether I can play this. That was an online uh, tour, so you can use uh, this online tool to uh, like visualize on the Google map and also analyze some kind of like the uh, periodic pattern or cluster patterns. So that, that was implemented while I was a student. So now, uh, we call this new one 2.0, because now I, I am the boss and I have pushed my student to do the work. <laughs> so that's a big, gap, uh, big leap, <laughs> so that's why I call it 2.0. But anyway, but this is a totally different one. It's not totally different, it just moved from, uh, bigger thing is I move from online to the software, so uh, it's easier for you to just like uh, do the things locally uh, without the burden of the server. And also, we, connect, we now connect with MooBank, and also we allow people to upload their local file for analysis. And the third change is definitely we add more uh, new functions we recently developed. So today I'm going to mainly uh, talk about two functions we recently added into this demo, and we're going to show the demo soon. Okay, so probably I'm going to show with the demo here. Okay. So uh, I'm going to release this one later. So it's just a, a Java package. So you can just double click on this uh, Java file, which is executable Java file. And then it asks you for the MoveBank login. You, you can log in using your MoveBank account ID and also password. Or you can log in just as a guest. You don't have to log in to the MoveBank. But once you log in into the MoveBank, you can easily pull the data from MoveBank if you have access to. Uh, for example, like I have access to this data. Uh, you can just type and search for the data. Or you can just see this uh, list here. And then you can search for the data. Mm, probably some of the data you don't have access to see. But for the data, or for example, like for this data, I do have access. You can either say download from the server. Uh, or you can, if you download it before, you don't keep you don't need to keep downloading it. So we keep a local copy, so you can just use the local copy. And once you click on this, it shows some very basic uh, statistics of the data. Like it shows the data set name, uh, how many individuals in this data set, and uh, what's the time, stamp, uh, time span of the tracking of this data set, and what's the average sampling rate. Okay, so these are the basic uh, statistics. And then you can say, OK, if you want to analyze just individuals, you can just select two or select multiples for analysis. Okay, so, or you can select the starting time and ending time. Here is a calendar. So you can just select a particular time frame for analysis. But this is a basic uh, tool implementation. So you can do some linear interpolation of the data to fill in the gap. So these are just two parameters to do the linear, uh, linear uh, interpolation. So one gap is what's the uh, sampling rate you want to fill in the gap. So you, we recommend you choose something that's similar to the data sampling rate. Okay. And there is a threshold gap. That means if it's longer, if the missing gap is longer than one hour, then we don't do any interpolation within this one hour. So we just treat those data points within this like 
uh, missing period as missing. So because we don't want to introduce error. Okay, so that's the parameters. So, so these are very basic stuff. I'm just quickly show one function. Like for example, if you want to calculate the average Euclidean distance between two moving uh, two animals, so you can just click on this, and then the results will be saved to your folder, and you can just say OK, and then you can click on this HTML file, and this is visualized as a matrix. So the pairwise uh, Euclidean average Euclidean distance. Like you can click on this one and shows uh, something here is like average distance between these two animals here. And then the darker the color is, the closer they are. So the darker the color is, the, the smaller the number is. And the lighter the color is, the further away they are. Okay. So these are just some very simple things. And, and also, this one is output as a, CSL, a CSV file. So you can also see the results here. So there, it, it comes with a visualization and also a CSV file. Okay, so but that's not really the key thing I want to talk about today. I want to introduce two functions we recently developed. Um, so I'll go back to the slides. Okay, so these are the stuff I just mentioned. Okay, so uh, one function, the first function I want to talk about today is the attraction avoidance relationship mining. And so before I show this demo, probably I want to, um, I want to briefly introduce the idea behind this. Uh, function. And uh, so this is actually a recent paper we collaborate with uh, Roland and also uh, Mac. Uh, we published in the computer science conference. It's called a very large database conference. It's one of the best conferences in data mining community. And this is a mining significant attraction avoidance relationship. So the idea is actually quite simple. So we came up with this idea. We start with the simple one. So say you have two um, movements or trajectories, right? Say you have R and S, and then definitely the most straightforward way to measure the similarity is using the Euclidean distance, for example. So you can say, okay, for, for the pairwise uh, uh, like, uh, points, I measure the Euclidean distance and I see the average. Right? So that's the most uh, straightforward way to measure the similarity of two uh, trajectories. And definitely you can measure another way to say, okay, I want to see how many time points and two, um, two locations are spatially close. So we can call it uh, either co-locating frequency or say meeting frequency. So when they are within certain distance threshold, uh, that is when the meeting event occur. So we basically count how many times you're being spatially close. So for example, in this case, uh, if you say these are the distance threshold, then probably you have two timestamps that uh, they're spatially close, and you, we can say the meeting frequency is two. Okay, so that could be a measure of measuring how uh, close to uh, moving objects are or two animals are. Okay, but then yes, so may I? Oh yeah, that's a that's a concern. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Her question is, uh, what happens if the uh, the sampling are not synchronized, right? So basically, it means if they don't have the same number of the points, how to measure this distance? Yeah, I think there are different two ways. One is you can just do the linear interpolation to fill in the missing points to make them synchronized. Another way is you, there are other measures like uh, uh, probably most people know like dynamic time warping. So you can try to sweep, uh, adjust a little bit to match ahead and match uh, behind. So, but that's not really the point I'm going to talk about today. Yeah. So these are just the basics. Yeah. So we came from here, and then we are questioning whether this is really the measure we want. Okay. And so if you think about, if you say, okay, so uh, if you say the frequency equals to the relationship strength, so basically you are saying, okay, the more frequently two animals co-locate, the stronger the relationship are. Or on the other hand, you may say, okay, the less frequently they co-locate, the weaker the relationship is. Then we kind of doubt whether this is true. Okay, we came up with this example. So for example, in this case, if we have on this figure, say green is one animal, say animal A, and the blue is another animal, animal B, for example, okay then those red dots in between are the um, places they co-locate. 
where the meeting events occurred. Okay, so let's say they meet 10 times. They co-locate 10 times. They're being especially close 10 times. On the other hand, these are another two animals, say uh, X and Y. Okay, so X and Y, um, the blue one is X, green one is Y. And those are the places that are being spatially close at the same time. So in these two cases, actually, they are, uh, the frequency are both 10. So they're being spatially close for both 10 times. So if you say the meeting frequency equal to the relationship strength, then that basically means, OK, they have the same strength of the relationship. OK. But then we think it's not really the case. Because if you look at the background, so in this case, right? So in this case, actually, they have fewer, a little overlapping regions. So they're less likely to co-locate, right? So they have less probability to co-locate the same place at the same time because they have very little overlaps in their, uh, in their activity regions. But on this case, they sort of have the same activity region. So it's like we live in the same building, but we never, we seldom run into each other. Then this could be a case, um, they actually are more likely to meet more than 10 times. OK, so that's the idea. So we should not only look at what happened, like what is the meeting frequency. We should look at what is expected to happen. Right? So only when you compare with what happened with what expected to happen, then you may have better confidence to say uh, what the relationship is. So that is actually the whole idea. So in this case, probably they expect to meet less than 10 times because they have very little overlap. Then we think in this case, if they still meet 10 times, then that could be uh, the case that they're actually attracted to meet there. There could be some of the resource or something there, so they're attracted to meeting at the places they overlap. On the other hand, if they say, OK, we share exactly the same home range, but we, uh, we actually need to meet, expect to meet more than 10 times, but we actually don't then that's an indication of they could have a avoidance relationship because they should meet more often than expected. OK, is the idea clear? OK, so that's a very simple idea. So that's just the philosophy behind it. OK, then we say, and then how to actually get this value, whether they're attraction or avoidance, how to actually get expectation. So the idea is this. So we assume that nine hypothesis is if two movement sequence uh, sequences R and S are independent, then we assume if we randomly shuffle the sequence, the meeting frequency should remain the same. So this one is the original frequency in the original sequence. Okay? And this one is the one set after it, the shuffle. So that means if you randomly permutate the sequence, so uh, these two values should remain the same. If they do remain the same, then we think they are independent. So that means I'm not really affected by you. If I randomly move like this, then we will have the similar meeting frequency. OK? So for sure, if you shuffle both, it's equal to shuffle just one, because we only care about the relative uh, meeting events. OK? So if you do this, so then we can give, just give this example. So for example, here, in this case, we have R and S. And so each line here means two points are being spatially close. And then the red lines here means they're being spatially close at the same time. Then on this case, in this case here, the original meeting frequency is two because there are two uh, timestamps that are being spatially close. Right? So if I randomly shuffle it, so I shuffle S, the sequence of S in this way, okay, then you will get the new meeting frequency in this shuffle sequence as one because only one is synchronized, matched. Okay, and then definitely we have another way to shuffle it. If you shuffle it in this way, then probably this will give you zero because none of this um, matching is synchronized. Okay, then there are n factorial ways to do this permutation, right? So. There are n factorial ways to do this permutation. You can just keep doing it. And then you're going to give your a histogram. And this histogram says um, this x means what's the uh, frequency in the meeting frequency in the shuffle sequence. And the histogram here means how many, uh, what's the count of this mm, shuffle meeting frequency. OK, then the idea is 
the thing that is in the middle that is expected. So that means uh, most of the cases actually fall into this meeting frequency when you shuffle it. So that in the middle, that's expected. Right? So if this is what actually you observe, say this is what expected, but this is what you actually observe, then in this case, what you observe is much more, uh, is, uh, is larger than most of the uh, shuffled sequence. This is an attraction because uh, you actually meet more often than expected. Okay, if you want to get a value, then you can count what's the region space there. If there are 95 area on the left hand of it, then that means they're having attraction relationship with 95% significance, of significance. So this is just a very simple permutation test. Okay. And then on the other hand, definitely, if this actual frequency is on the left hand side, then that means they're having avoidance relationship. If say, okay, the area here is 98%, then they're actually having avoidance relationship with 98% significance. Okay, so that's basically the idea. So if this is expected, then the more to the right, the, the stronger the attraction relationship is, the more to the left, the stronger the avoidance relationship is. And for the most of the cases, we're only interested in the significant ones. So because most of stuff in between, we will consider as like neutral relationship. Okay, so we are interested in the significant ones. That means only when you are, say, higher than 95% or lower than 95%, then that's a strong indication of you are having a attraction avoidance relationship. Okay, is it clear? Yes? Yes, yeah, that is one concern we actually had. So maybe the random shuffle is not the best way to shuffle it. Right? So uh, I think the key point is whether, um, yeah, whether this background is accurately estimated. There could be other ways to shuffle it. But at this point, we only randomly shuffle it. Oh, we consider the sequence, right? So we do consider sequence. When you shuffle it, you do have the sequence. Yeah, you do still have the sequence when you shuffle it. Yeah, but we don't really consider the exact time point. But we preserve the sequence. Yes. Okay, yes? Yeah, I think that's a better idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, later we, we thought about it. I think it's better you first feed into a model than probably you randomly. So her question is whether we should probably feed into a random model first and randomly permutate in, in terms of the model, right? So yeah, I think that's, that could be, yes, that could be a good idea. But I think the key point is then we want to see whether it fits a random work model or not. So if it does, the random work does explain the phenomenon, then that would be perfect to first feed into the model, then random permutate it. That could be, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yeah. That's a good idea, yeah. OK. Yeah, probably I want to hurry up because I have another function <laughs> to show. Yeah, but anyway, we did these experiments uh, using uh, max data on the Panama monkey. And for this one, actually, they have uh, 12 monkeys, and they divide it into s uh, six groups. And if we do this random um, test, uh, like a significant test, uh, the green line here means two monkeys, they have a strong attraction relationship. And then the, blue, uh, the red one here means they have a strong avoidance relationship. So actually, you can see it, um, this kind of whole network, what kind of attraction avoidance relationship they have. Um, some things are trivial, like for example, for each group, they have two monkeys. So within each group, like a pairwise relationship, definitely they have strong attraction relationship because they keep moving together in their home range. So these are the trivial ones, like those ones, they have strong attraction relationship, they are all within the same group. Okay, so it's more interesting to see the intergroup, what's their relationship. For example, like this one. So this one correspond, these two uh, monkeys correspond to the blue one here, and these two correspond to the yellow one here. 
So these two, they actually have pairwise uh, attraction relationship. So because if you see these two, they actually have very little overlapping region, but actually they do interact quite, not that often, but actually uh, interact at a certain, um, with certain times. So actually it's higher than expected because they don't really share a very big overlapping uh, home range. Okay, on the other hand, if you see these two, so the same is this yellow one and also this blue one. So this blue one corresponds to this blue one here, and this yellow one corresponds to the yellow one here. They share a much larger overlapping region compared with this yellow one and the purple one. And they actually, they meet the same amount of time as the other two groups. So, but apparently, they share a much larger overlapping region. They should meet more. So these two, that's why we get they have um, pairwise avoidance relationship intergroups. And also Meg mentioned, uh, she actually has observed several fights between these two groups. So it seems to be more aggressive for these two groups. Okay, so I want to go back to demo to quickly show it. So we have implemented this function here. So if you have your data, you want to use this method to analyze it, uh, you can either, as I say, you can either put the data from MoveBank or can, you can just like upload here, you can say, the data I just show is the monkey data. Okay, so this shows the basic statistics of this data. Like there are 12 monkeys tracking from uh, maybe half a year, and then the sampling rate is about 10 minutes. And then you can do this. You can say I want to mine the attraction and avoidance mining. So there are two parameters. One parameter is how many random permutations you want to do. The more times you do, the the more confident the result is, but usually we find the results converge after 100 rounds. So 100 could be a good parameters. But definitely the larger this number is, the slower, uh, the longer the computation will take. So this distance threshold uh, defines, uh, what, what do you def how do you define the spatially close? How do you define the meeting events? Okay. So you can click on go. And so this one will compute the pairwise uh, relationship. <coughs> okay, so again, the results will save to your local folder, and you can click on this HTML. It's similar to that distance one, uh, but this one shows the uh, attraction and um, avoidance relationship. For example, like you can see, these two, uh, it says the significant value is zero. Actually, that means they're having avoidance. So the more red it is, the the more uh, avoidance relationship they have, the stronger avoidance relationship they have. So the greener it is, the stronger attraction relationship they have. So this one actually will give you uh, the pairwise attraction avoidance relationship. Okay, but most of the cases you will see those yellow colors. That means they're actually neutral relationship. It's not really strong, strongly correlated or impacted by the other. Okay, and. The same, you can see the results as a C C CSV file. I'm not going to open this. And there is actually another function for you to further analyze it. So this function here, you can plot the meeting places that actually to, so you can say, okay, I want to see why uh, 51 and 83, they're having attraction relationship. I want to see what are the places they actually meet. So you can choose 51 and 80 and 83, and then you can say generate. I'm not going to click on this, it takes like a few seconds. But I already have one here, so you can see. <clears throat> then this one will give you something here. So these are the Panama monkeys. And so this will generate a KML file, you can just open using the Google Earth. And these are those two monkeys, their, their trajectories. And then in this one, it shows, let me track it. Okay, so in this one, it shows. So it shows two things. So one thing are the places they actually meet. So those are the locations the meeting events actually occur. Okay, so they're being spatially close. And this one is actually the locations. They, sh they could be spatially close based on the definition, okay? So this is just a further analysis if you want to see 
more why this, uh, how to really explain this attraction and avoidance. Okay, so that's one. Um, any question about this one before I show the other one? Okay, yeah, you, if you have a question, we can discuss more offline. I'm going to rush a little bit to talk about the second one. Uh, okay, so the second one, a uh, function we recently implemented is this uh, follower and leadership detection. Um, so this is also a recent paper we published in the International Conference on Data Mining, which is also one of the top venue in our community. So uh, the idea of this one is, uh, Different from the one we just introduced, we think this one is more like a, a generic relationship to say, overall, what's their relationship? But this one, we try to identify the time windows or time intervals where the following and the leadership, uh, leadering pattern occur. Okay, so we are trying to, given two uh, trajectories, we're trying to identify, okay, those are the intervals where one is following another. Okay, so, but this is quite, I think, it seems straightforward, but we realized this was a quite challenging problem. So this shows one of the results we identify. So for example, here you can see the blue one follows the red one, right? But why it's challenging? Because uh, the time lag is always varying. So it doesn't mean I'm following you, I'm following you strictly uh, after every mi one minute. So it, sometimes I could closely follow, sometimes I could lag far away. Okay, and also the trajectory may not look exactly the same, so it doesn't mean it's just simply moving as a straight line. Okay, we could take terms and we could make some changes in the trajectory, not exactly the same. And also, given your very long uh, trajectory, uh, this usually only happens for a very short time period. For example, this one shows like a nine minutes time period of following, but overall this does, doesn't happen all the time. So you have to quickly identify what are the time interval this actually happens. Okay, so uh, we actually first try some other methods using like so-called front region. Like this method, they define, um, if you say R follows S, then S should always be in front of me. So I think that's the natural, uh, most intuitive way people will define this uh, following pattern. But then we realize it doesn't work because they take turns. Okay, so we actually come up with a very simple solution. We think it works pretty good because we find some interesting results. So the idea, I, I probably will, you need to rush a little bit <laughs> to explain the idea. So the idea is quite simple. So if you say, okay, this still the same, if you have R and S, then for each R here, I try to look for the, um, I have a time window to scan through all the S there. So I will scan two steps back, two uh, uh, time steps uh, forward. So I scan this time window. Okay, then I find the one that is closest to this one. Then I say, okay, this one is the closest to this one. So basically I find the closest time point. And another parameter we have here is it needs to be close within certain distance because if you say following, you shouldn't follow really, really long distance. I mean, it shouldn't be like more than, say, 10, 100 miles away, right? So you do have a certain threshold to here to define um, spatially close. So these are the two holding threshold you have. One is the time window lo you look for uh, in the other um, movements, and another one is the distance threshold. Okay, then for each point in R, you're going to match with the other point in this way. You, you have a time window, you scan it, then you find the one that is closest, you match with it. Okay, then each one you're going to find is a matching. Right? Then, uh, then now we look at uh, the time difference between this matching, say uh, Ri and Sj. We see whether Sj is ahead of it or is behind it. Okay, if we say, uh, SI is ahead of R3, let's say we, we put it as green. So that means at this point, S is in front, uh, is ahead of me, okay? And so we put those green because S is in front, uh, is ahead of R. And those, they're not necessarily, they're actually uh, matching with the same timestamp. So we put them as gray color, that means it's not leading. So then you're going to have these different colors. So basically, if you say, I put the green ones as one here, 
So now this one will turn into a binary sequence with 0 and 1, where 1 means a following matching happened. Okay. Then for a very long sequence, we basically try to identify the time window with a lot of ones. Right? Because this had a lot of ones. A lot of ones means a lot of following points happened. Okay. So uh, for example, in this case, we call it a significant following time interval. That is the time when you have a lot of ones. But you shouldn't just count the number of ones, because if you do that, then you're going to output the whole sequence, because the whole sequence has most number of ones. right? So you should compare with what is expected. So if the length, if the interval length is, say, uh, like n, for example, then you should expect, if they're actually moving together instead of following, then you should actually expect half of the following, half of the leading. So you should expect half of the one, half of the zero. Right. So this is what expected. So uh, if these two numbers, the difference between these two numbers is very big, that means there is a significant more ones than zero. So that's the basic idea. So if you see significantly difference of the one and the zero, then that means this is significant following interval. Okay. So we are trying to identify the, those intervals with the, lot, with the biggest difference between one and zeros. Okay, so probably I'm going to skip this. I'm going to show a demo very quick. So this is the, we first tried this on the bamboo data. And I want to quickly show this. So if you say this bamboo data, we pick two bamboos uh, in this particular hour, on this particular day. And um, this is just one to, for, for the purpose of this uh, visualization, but you can actually do for the whole data set. And the remo is the one we just mentioned. It's defining the front region. And we realize because they move, they take turns. So remo is going to give you a lot of very small intervals, which doesn't really give you the insights of the following pattern. But we can actually find the longer intervals where you can see the following pattern. So I'm going to demo it very quickly. So this is the last thing I want to show. <coughs> OK, so I have some bamboo data here. It's from Mac. OK, so this bamboo data is really, really high resolution. It's like uh, one second sampling rate. OK, and then for this one, you don't have to do interpolation. And then you can say, I'll try to mind the following. So these two are the parameters I just mentioned. And these are the, for the post processing. So, <coughs> so if you click on this one, so this is going to give you the results of when, what are the time intervals one follow the other. This, are, this one only shows one hour data. So this one shows, OK, 38 follows 5 for those intervals, and 5 follows 38 for those intervals. OK, so if you want to see, further see this first interval, you can go to this KML folder, and this corresponds to this one. Okay, so these are in Kenya. And you can do a very simple visualization by playing. So in this case, that is the following time interval. And you can see the red kind of leading the blue. Yeah, so this interval lasts for like six minutes. Uh, and then I think from visualization, you can see actually the blue is following, sort of chasing the red. So in this one, we are going to give you all the intervals, like longer intervals, we think this kind of pattern happen. OK. So let me see. OK. Yes, yeah, so I think this is the last one I want to show. So many of these two functions, I'm going to release to two. Uh, right after this, well, after I go back to Penn State, and then you are very welcome to download it and then play it with your own data. Okay, and I just want to say some acknowledgement. This one is implement mostly implemented by my student, also student, uh, in my former advisors group. 
And also, I appreciate Roland and Matt give me the feedback and also very valuable discussion. And also, definitely very valuable data set to verify the results. Okay, thank you.